Um, so everybody, welcome to uh, SV at Home is presenting Affordable Housing Month. Um, in the city of Milpitas, we also celebrate the month of May as Affordable Housing and Building Safety Month. Um, and as a result, we thought it would be a perfect opportunity to have our partners at SV at Home um, allow us to, to host a webinar with um, Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley as they sort of bridge that building safety and affordable housing uh, pretty well. And um, so today I've got Elena Purcell with me. Elena, nice to. Hi, nice to everybody. <laughs> Um, so just a couple of things up top, um, really the central message of Affordable Housing Month is that everyone deserves access to a safe, stable, and affordable home, um, and that message seems more relevant now than ever before as we go through this, uh, this really troubling time. Um, so we really appreciate SB at Home allowing us to, to do a joint presentation with Rebuilding Together and um, in general for, for more of the Affordable Housing Month events, you can go to SV uh, at Home's website. There's a link uh, in this uh, on this slide that we'll put in the chat box, um, and we'll make available to you as well. Uh, but they have a they have a whole another uh, week left of events, and uh, and you know you should check out their events, and you can also check out some of the replays from their events as well um, because they have a lot of great content. So with that, we'll go to the next slide, um, and sort of a shameless plug, uh, but. Um, the city of Milpitas is a proud bronze sponsor of uh, SV at Home. Again, we're really happy with the partnership we have and proud of the work that they do. So um, very happy to be a bronze sponsor and to participate in Affordable Housing Month. So I think that's all the pitching that I need to do up front. And we still have the same three cool cats and kittens in the attendee list. So I think we'll, uh, we'll, just, we'll just keep it moving. I like the reference to the Tiger King. No idea yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Elena Purcell. I'm uh, with Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley. I'm our Partnership Development and Community Outreach Manager. Um, I'll echo Robert's sentiments. I'm really excited to be participating in partnership with SV at Home and the City of Milpitas to bring to you tonight a presentation um, really focused around the idea of keeping you and your family safe at home. Um, now, in these unprecedented times and really uncertain times, this is more important um, than ever. Uh, of course, we're gonna cover some information about rebuilding together Silicon Valley and our programs and how we can really be of help, um, not only to the residents of Santa Clara County, but specifically the residents of Milpitas. Um, and then we'll cover some, uh, the eight healthy, uh, safe and healthy housing principles as established by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So uh, let's get into it. Here is what to expect out of tonight's webinar. Um, as I had mentioned, um, you know, we're gonna cover the three P's of affordable housing, um, a little bit more than what Robert kind of introduced there. Um, we're also gonna get into the history of rebuilding together Silicon Valley and the three programs that we offer our Santa Clara County residents. Um, we're gonna talk just briefly about some of the response that we've been able to provide in response to COVID-19 and the current pandemic. Um, and then we have some updates as well. This just changed as of this week. So we're happy to update everyone on that information. And then we're gonna get into the eight principles of safe and healthy housing. And we'll, get, we'll go through each of those eight um, and then we'll finish up with the question and answer portion. So I think kind of dependent on the flow of today's webinar, we may pepper in some questions as things go along, uh, or we may just wait and do some question and answer at the end. Um, but a few housekeeping notes, I think everyone is muted in case you weren't aware. Um, we are having that set up just so it prevents some background noise. Um, and then also if we're encouraging people to utilize that chat feature or I think um, the question and answer feature as well. So if you do have any comments or questions, please feel free to utilize that chat feature down at the bottom of your screen. And all right, let's get into it. So the three P's of affordable housing, um, as Robert mentioned, it is Affordable Housing Month, um, and we're really excited to be participating in this. Uh, so it's really focused around advocacy around what we call the three P's, and those are gonna be protection, preservation, and production. Um, the protection is really kind of the idea of advocacy work, um, 
and protecting especially our renters now more than ever. The preservation is really focused around um, the idea of our existing housing stock being able to remain uh, sufficient for potential renters as well as our communities of low income homeowners. Um, and then of course we have the production and that's gonna be focused mostly around construction um, and the idea of uh, building multifamily units to ensure that our communities remain stable and that people have places to live that they can afford. So who's rebuilding together Silicon Valley? I'm really excited to be able to introduce you all to our organization. If you haven't heard from us before or heard of us before, um, rebuilding together actually was founded in uh, Texas in 1973 as a national organization. Um, and the old kind of legend goes, there was a group of neighbors in Texas that kind of looked around one day and realized a lot of their neighbors' homes had fallen into disrepair and they just didn't have, um, the resources to be able to fix them themselves. Uh, so the neighbors banded together, uh, they put together a big building day, um, one fateful day in April, and upon one neighbor seeing her newly repaired home, she exclaimed rather loudly, it's like Christmas in April. Um, and that's where our organization was founded. Uh, we were initially called Christmas in April, and then we were later um, changed to Rebuilding Together, just to make it a little more inclusive. Um, if you fast forward to today in 2020, we are a network of 130 individually operating affiliates throughout 39 states and the continental US. Um, and then of course us here specifically uh, in the Silicon Valley, we were founded in 1991, really truly under the belief that everyone deserves to live in a safe and healthy home. Um, we do free home repairs for low income homeowners, and we also do free repairs for our local nonprofit and public facilities that have a physical space that maybe don't necessarily have the funds to put towards that maintenance and that repair. Um, so we're really proud to be able to provide those services for our neighbors in need and our local community here throughout Santa Clara County. Um, how do we accomplish that work? We have three specific programs. So we have what we call our safety at home program. And that's going to be focused around the idea that as our homes age or our spaces age, um, they should adapt alongside us. Um, our executive director, Deanne Everton, always gives us that old saying, uh, the idea that when you have a child, you baby proof a home and not necessarily to say you need to baby proof a home for adults, but you do in a way need to make sure that your home isn't just serving you for one portion of your life, one time where you may have certain physical needs and not the entirety of your life. So it's the idea that, um, you know, we can install wheelchair ramps or lifts. We can do modifications to bathrooms, specifically grab bars. Uh, we'll do shower cutouts. Um, you kind of name it, if you could imagine it, that it would make your home a safer environment for you. It can typically fall within the bounds of the work that we'll do within that program. And then next up, we have what we call our critical repairs program, and that's focused around anything that could render a home potentially uninhabitable. So um, really the idea that, you know, we'll do roof replacements, roof repairs, um, anything that could be catastrophic to a potential homeowner, a hot water heater, a furnace replacement. And we do work with local, um, local subcontractors to accomplish that work as it is broader scale. And, and we require, of course, the utmost professionalism when we do those repairs for our homeowners. So our last program that we offer is what we call Rebuilding Days. Uh, it's a really exciting kind of culminating work to those two year round programs that we offer. Uh, we usually focus on beautification projects or sort of finishing touches. And uh, this is when we really rally our community behind us. We have a number of corporate sponsors that participate and volunteers we typically have you know, 25 plus projects, 600 plus volunteers, all working together on one day to really put those finishing touches on that potential home. It's a really heartwarming event. It's really wonderful. It's a great experience. Um, unfortunately, we have had to put our, our volunteer opportunities on hold for the time being due to the uncertain times. And of course, we want to ensure the utmost safety for everyone. Um, but we are hoping to get back to that as soon as we possibly can. So I will note, um, just last little thing, uh, here in the Bay Area, we do have four affiliates. So of course we have a Rebuilding Together San Francisco, we have a Rebuilding Together Peninsula, we have ourselves here in the Silicon Valley servicing the greater Santa Clara County, and then we have an Oakland East Bay affiliate as well. And we do all operate independently, but we also, of course, collaborate and work together as well. Okay. Oh, 
are we doing uh, at We're Building Together in response to COVID-19? Specifically, um, we're really fortunate. We do have a warehouse location here in San Jose. Um, and we were able to house a number of personal protective equipment. Again, going back to that idea that we do have a number of volunteers that participate in our programs on an annual basis. Uh, we ensure their safety at the utmost possible way. Um, so typically we have things like goggles and gloves and N95 masks on hand. And we were able to donate over 450 individual pieces of PPE equipment to our fellow nonprofit facilities uh, that are servicing our medical workers on the front lines of the pandemic. So we were really proud to be able to do that. Um, we're also doing what we're calling wellness calls. It's the idea that, you know, we have a database full of really wonderful homeowners throughout the Santa Clara County that are maybe more isolated than ever, or maybe don't necessarily have the resources um, that some of our other homeowners do. And so we're reaching out and just kind of creating a sense of community, checking in on their welfare, letting them know that as an organization, we're there for them. We can provide resources if necessary. Um, and that, you know, of course, no one has forgotten about them. And then lastly, we've been able to provide our critical repairs. So going back to that idea that we have that critical repairs program, our work was deemed essential during this time. So we were able to still work with some of our subcontractors on exterior style projects. Um, and then I'm really excited to share that as of this week, our two in-house technicians have been able to go back and focus on our safety repairs as well. Um, we're following CDC and OSHA guidelines. Uh, we're, we're saying the old term, uh, safely working. Um, and our, of course, the focus is that our homeowners are as safe as possible, as well as our technicians and anyone else that would be on the work site. Um, so we do have some challenges. We're not currently servicing any inside projects, any interior work, um, until we feel like we can comfortably and confidently manage that. But we are doing exterior projects for the time being. So moving right along, uh, these are what we call the eight safe and healthy housing principles. Um, as I had mentioned at the top of the hour, they are established by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, and here at Rebuilding Together, we say keep it. So the best way to go about it is just to say, keep your home clean, keep it dry, keep it safe, keep it pest free, keep it well ventilated, keep it thermally controlled, keep it maintained, and keep it contaminant free. And today we are specifically gonna get into each of these eight topics, um, just to give you a little bit more information on each one and understand how we can empower you as a homeowner to service your home yourself and provide um, some confidence there, but also in case you do need to reach out to neighbors or family members or professionals to provide you some information with that as well. So I am going to move through these pretty quickly just to ensure I'm not taking up too much of everyone's time this evening. So let's get into it. Keep it clean. The impact of a clean and dry home on your health and safety. So why are clean homes so important to our health? A clean home reduces exposure to a variety of toxins, things like chemical contaminants, allergens, pest droppings in urine, pesticides and consumer chemicals, heavy metals such as lead and arsenic, and of course, a clean home reduces the likelihood that pests or problems related to pests would also settle in. And as our lovely woman here on the right is saying, clean home is a joyful home. So what can you do specifically to ensure that your home is the cleanest it can be? Um, we always recommend start by making a to-do list. Um, recruit someone for assistance with heavier items, especially if you have mobility concerns or physical constraints, um, or you're just necessarily concerned about your overall health. It's a great way to bond with a neighbor, with a family member, or again, to call on someone else to assist you. We always recommend decluttering before cleaning to avoid trip hazards. Falls prevention is really important to us as well. We'll cover some more of that later, but um, before you really dive into cleaning, you wanna ensure that the environment around you is as safe as possible to do so. And then we also encourage you to give yourself some adequate time. Uh, definitely don't feel rushed by any means, um, especially if this is something you haven't necessarily done in quite some period of time. You can take it slow and be easy on yourself. And then we also recommend making it a group activity. If you do have family, friends, neighbors, this is a great way to kind of have a community rally around you and be able to help uh, where you need that assistance. Okay, so at Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley, um, 
for us, how we can help you keep your home clean, uh, we can help you by removing carpet and replacing it with smooth, cleanable floor. Typically, we recommend um, a wood or a laminate flooring versus carpeting. I know sometimes carpeting is much more comfortable, but it also can house a number of pests and a number of dirt. Um, and other allergen um, exacerbants that we don't necessarily want to keep around. Um, so we also would do, we would keep any project and work sites as clean as possible and any subcontractors that we would hire or any other professionals should do the same. Uh, we clean up any areas that could be potentially contaminated by pests, of course. Uh, check and regularly replace furnace filters. This is extremely important to ensure that your air quality is not consistently being contaminated as well. And then we uh, make sure your filters are well sealed, again, to protect the integrity of those, uh, those furnace filters. And we do recommend that each furnace filter that you have should be rated at what they call a MERV 11 or 13 level or higher. Uh, definitely nothing lower, otherwise it's just not considered a high enough level uh, to prevent potential toxins and allergens from entering the home. All right, so part two, keeping it dry, the impact of a dry home on your health and safety. So why is keeping a dry home so important? Um, actually, there are a number of health benefits that come from keeping your home dry. Things like excessive dampness can affect occupant health. Moisture and mold have been known to exacerbate or cause asthma, um, as well as a number of other respiratory issues, including coughing and wheezing or much worse. Uh, moisture is also a key contributor to successful pest coloni colonization. Typically, drier buildings have less of a concern around pests, so they're correlative. Um, and then moisture can cause damage through deterioration or structural material. Um, and not all moisture problems are apparent. As we know, sometimes they're behind walls or in an area that you wouldn't necessarily see, and they can lead to sort of what we call a cascade effect and cause more issues down the road. All right, so what does it mean to keep it pest free? Um, pests actually can be really detrimental to our health, as many of us can imagine. Um, they're harmful not only to humans' physical health, but also our mental health. The dander, the excrement, uh, shedding of skin, this uh, can all cause a variety of issues, including allergens and other things. The spreading of bacteria or viruses is also a huge problem. Uh, stress, mental health concern, and household expenses. As you can imagine, if you're experiencing this sort of infestation from a pest, it not only stresses you out, it maybe could cause potential loss of sleep, but also it's expensive to deal with. So as much as we can do to prevent these things from happening, we really want to. They can contaminate our countertops and of course then our food, especially in preparation spaces. Um, they can aggravate our allergies. And then as many of us know, rodents specifically carry um, additional health concerns and they can actually cause property damage. So if rodents are chewing through wires or you know, worse insulation or walls, um, it's just not an optimal environment for a safe and healthy home. So the, another thing that we always note for individuals that pesticide is not always a good alternative, uh, specifically doing it yourself. Um, oftentimes, people don't necessarily realize that they can cause serious health hazards, such as ear, nose, and throat irritations, stomach cramps, nausea, central nervous system damage, kidney damage, and of course, it can increase risk of cancer. Again, those are chemicals that you're potentially breathing in, you and your family members. Um, and also those do-it-yourself store-bought pesticides typically don't get to the root of the problem. Um, many of us feel like we're empowering ourselves and trying to get rid of a problem, which is really great. But ultimately, if it's not getting to the root of those pests, um, as we know, they're pests for a reason and they can colonize, unfortunately, rather successfully. Um, so we don't want to be poisoning ourselves in our attempts to create a safer environment. Okay, so what can you do uh, to recognize a pest-free home and to empower yourself to get a pest-free home if you're experiencing some of these concerns? Uh, start by recognizing potential factors, um, things like dampness, uh, signs of infestation, those are typically sort of related to droppings or other things, um, and then of course keeping our home proactively clean. This is all preventative and it's all intertwined and interrelated. You can take preventative measures in advance of infestation, like the cleaning that we talked about a few slides ago. Um, and then of course, you can also call a professional. Um, our organization, Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley, we're gonna inspect and address concerns professionally and safely, and any other professional should do the same as well. 
And does, does that include like wasp nests? Like what, what, what would somebody do if they have uh, like wasp nests outside their home? How would they go about taking care that of that? That's a great question. <laughs> I, would, um, I would definitely not recommend anyone take care of that themselves. Um, call a professional. Unfortunately, wasps can actually be quite dangerous. Um, and typically people have allergies and they don't necessarily even know how severe those allergy, allergic reactions can be. Um, I think sometimes we're tempted to sort of go out there and, and take care of it. It seems like a bother and not necessarily a serious concern, but wasp stings can be, um, you know, pretty dangerous. Um, and then of course, if, if it's, if it's actually a hive, that could be quite dangerous as well. So again, I would just recommend calling a professional. Um, and if you feel like you, necess you can't necessarily afford that calling rebuilding together, Silicon Valley, again, we do those things for free. And, um, if you didn't qualify necessarily, we would of course recommend someone that would be able to take care of that for you. Thank you, Robert. Um, so yeah, we would, you know, inspect um, and address areas of concern. That's the number one thing any professional should do is just inspect for things as they're professionally trained that they maybe will recognize that you as a homeowner may not necessarily. And then um, be proactive, be protective and address things professionally and safely for our homeowners. Okay, I'm gonna move to the next slide. So the next topic is well ventilated. Um, a well-ventilated home actually has a variety of also health benefits, as you can imagine, since that's sort of the nature of today's discussion. Um, keeping a home well-ventilated uh, oftentimes lowers rates of respiratory illness and irritation. A lack of proper ventilation can actually exacerbate problems or lead to other problems, things like cold, common colds, flu, asthma, pneumonia, a variety of other respiratory illnesses um, and health concerns, as we know, can lead to things like loss of work or school. So again, we want to make sure we have that optimal environment, not only for ourselves, but our family members um, that live at home with us or that visit the home. Um, and we want to ensure that we're not having, you know, additional economic effects from potential illnesses. Uh, kind of in our industry, we find out all too often that your lifespan is actually more correlated to your zip code than your actual genetic code. Um, and so oftentimes that has to do with the type of home that you're living in and the environment that you're in. So as much as we can take some control back and empower ourselves to live in the safest environment, we really wanna focus on that. Um, next up, of, corp of course, proper ventilation can reduce exposure to what we call VOCs or volatile organic compounds. We'll cover some of that a little bit more later as well, but those are things like tobacco smoke, allergens, moisture, and mold that are sort of organically occurring in the environment. Um, tobacco smoke isn't necessarily organic, but it sort of is inherent at this point. Um, and so again, all things that could be coming in and then staying in the recycled air of a home if it's not well ventilated. So what can you do? Um, really truly go through these questions. Uh, places to be most concerned about are areas where you're either cooking or you're gonna experience the most dampness. So kitchens and bathrooms are the most important to have functioning ventilation. Um, here we say make sure your home has a functioning bathroom, or I'm sorry, a functioning fan in each bathroom. Um, and does your kitchen have a vent and does it work properly? Do you have a professional you call? Do you have someone that you would recommend or someone that could recommend someone for you? And if not, again, please always call our building together, Silicon Valley. We would love to be a resource for our community, even if it's, even if it's you know, not necessarily that we are doing the repairs, but we can be, act as a resource to help you. Um, and then do take note, we say not all fans are created equally. And that's because unless a fan is actually ducted to the exterior of a home and is working properly and functioning optimally, it's not really doing its job. And sometimes it can actually make it worse. It's kind of recycling the dust um, or other contaminants. So again, make sure those are all working properly. Quick and question. then as we talk, oh Just yeah, go ahead. Um, so the, the ventilation prevents mold and mildew. Um, what, mm -hmm. what are and, and what are signs of mold that may not be as obvious for people um, in, in a yeah. less than well ventilated house? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, so typically uh, where we sort of recommend people start is if you're experiencing what you might consider um, signs of allergies, um, but it's not really necessarily allergy season or it's not really typical of your body um, to react that way, that can sort of be a spark for potential concern. We also encourage people to kind of look around if you've got black spots on your walls, especially over paint, or um, if you've got discolored 
route or tile, um, especially in, um, you know, again, kitchens or bathrooms, if there starts to be discoloration and you can't necessarily, it's, it's, you know, deeper than um, an exterior problem. Um, those are sort of signs. Um, sometimes you don't necessarily know it, and it is, in, again, behind a wall, um, but oftentimes professionals are trained to kind of recognize those signs, even if it's just like the slightest shadowing of a paint. Sometimes it means that behind the wall there could be something going on at a deeper level. So again, you just want to inspect that and make sure that um, it's not, you know, contributing or exacerbating your health concerns. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so part five, uh, what it means to have a safe home. This is just as important as the rest. Um, oftentimes, uh, this is actually a list that's of the highest rated concerns that healthcare professionals submit uh, based on what they see that as um, people come into ICUs or hospital settings of injuries that have happened in a home that are highly preventable. Um, so again, creating awareness and empowering ourselves to, to hopefully prevent as much of this as possible is, is our goal here today. So choking and suffocation, um, drowning, electrical shock, entry by intruders, fires and burns, uh, firearms related injuries, poisoning, and trips and falls are all, again, what our healthcare professionals are seeing as the highest rated occurrences of injuries in our homes. Um, and we want to ensure that we're, we're preventing those where and, and, and if possible. Um, so here at Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley, the two things that we focus on specifically the most out of this particular list are um, fire prevention and falls prevention. And that, that's because a lot of those other things unfortunately don't necessarily fall within repair work. Um, but we do always say, um, you know, we give our homeowners a variety of tips and kind of going back to what we were talking about when we were discussing cleaning, um, really ensuring that you don't have trip hazards throughout your home is going to be tremendous in falls prevention. Uh, rearranging your furniture if it is arranged in a way that it's blocking an accessible walkway. Um, rearranging it so that it makes that walkway accessible and that you're not having cords or other issues or even a rug, an open drawer, um, anything that you could think of that could you, you could potentially trip on or fall from. We want to prevent that as much as possible. Uh, it's actually for a lot of our homeowners um, in it's rated the number one reason for anyone age 60 or older why they end up in a hospital or an ICU is from a fall um, and it's the number two reason for anyone over the age of 50 so it's a concern even if you don't consider yourself an older adult it's something many of us um, should be more aware of okay so as I had mentioned the two top areas that we do focus on that falls prevention um, as we had talked about, not only is it, is it a prevalent concern, but it also can cause a cascade of health effects um, and overall your quality of life. Um, unfortunately, typically, um, as we age and if we experience a fall, our time in recovery extends and it can lead to a variety of other issues. So again, as much as we can prevent that, we want to. Um, and then fire prevention, that's really important. Uh, unfortunately, an average of seven people die per day in U.S. home fires, and they're usually very preventable. Um, and top sources of house fires are things like the areas you're cooking in, heating equipment, electrical lighting, and then clothing dryers. So clothing dryers are actually um, a really large concern, and we want to encourage people um, to uh, have, again, professionals come out and inspect your, your clothing dryer, or if you yourself feel like you're equipped to handle that, we have some resources we can share with you for that as well. Um, so over here in our home safety tip number two, we do recommend that people have smoke detectors. Uh, if you have a two-story home, we recommend you have at least one on each level. Um, and closer to a bedroom as possible, that's a, a great idea. And then of course, we also recommend people install carbon monoxide detectors. I believe here in California, especially if you are a landlord, it is mandatory. And again, it's all um, ensuring that we're safe and healthy at home. How long do these fire detectors, um, these, do, they, do they typically last? Is there a, a time frame that, that people should check these to make sure that they're still functioning properly? Yes, definitely. So we do encourage people to get what we call a 10-year fire uh, detector, and that's going to utilize a lithium battery over an alkaline battery. Um, oftentimes the alkaline battery um, smoke detectors 
only last for a year. And so that, you know, that enables you to have a functioning detector for up to 10 years that you're not necessarily having, any, having to keep maintenance up on or check in on. And it's going to ensure, you know, that hopefully that time doesn't lapse and that detector no longer works. Okay. Um, so things that you can do to keep your home safe, um, you know, make sure you have proper smoke alarms and that you have the number that if you, again, if you have a two-story home, look into putting an additional one if you only have one. Uh, be sure to maintain clutter and address potential trip hazards as we talked about. Keep clothing dryer vents clean and clear. Be sure that all entrances and exits are secure. And uh, ultimately, if you have concerns or you'd just like somebody to do a once over and inspect your house to make sure that things really do uh, look optimally functioning and safe and healthy, uh, that piece of calling a professional is always a really great idea as well. So at Rebuilding the Other Silicon Valley, I mean, you can imagine we're going to inspect, uh, we're going to address concerns, including vents, electrical wiring, etc. cetera. Um, and then, of course, we're going to um address if you don't have any not if you have any non-viable wiring so if there's any wiring and it's not live that's or you have electrical outlets that aren't working uh we'll address that we'll properly clean and replace your dryer vents and install reliable 10-year uh, smoke and co detectors as a, as robert and i just discussed okay so part six uh contaminant free um the main contaminants that we kind of experience in our home actually have a really severe effect on our health and safety as well. So as I had mentioned briefly earlier, that we have what we call VOCs, um, and those can be things like environmental tobacco, secondhand and thirdhand smoke, um, lead-based paint, asbestos, those VOCs again, um, pesticides, and then radon. So we'll get into each of these a little bit more in detail. Um, Lead-based paint is actually well documented uh, in use for the exterior of the home for homes built prior to 1978. So if your home um, was built prior to 1978 and you don't know if you have lead-based paint, it's really important that you get that tested. Uh, there are lead-based paint kits available at any local hardware store, um, but I will warn you that they're, they become an issue when they become airborne and the dust is inhaled. So you do want to be really careful. And again, we always recommend calling a professional for something that could be that dangerous. Um, the largest concern is that it does cause brain development trauma in children. Um, and if you're ever going to have any exterior work done on your home, if there's any type of cracking or peeling or dust coming off of your, of your paint, that's where this is really going to be a concern. And again, it does go out into the environment and it spreads. So even if you don't necessarily have children in your own home, this could negatively impact your neighbors. Um, so just, of course, you know, knowing um, the year your home was built, uh, whether or not you would have lead-based paint on the exterior, and then, of course, having a professional address that concern for you. Asbestos is actually also a health risk once, it's be once it becomes airborne. It can cause serious lung issues, um, and it's typically found in pipe insulation, older cement siding and shingles, boiler insulation, and vinyl floor tiles. Okay, so what are those VOCs that we kind of talked about? So this is interesting. Oftentimes this is, uh, this is described as that new car smell. So if you've ever been in a new car and you kind of, you identify that smell or anytime you buy sort of a new piece of furniture or something that you're going to put together, um, this is typically chemicals that are found in manufacturing and building materials, things like paints, stains, sealers, composite wood flooring, and cabinets. Um, and there is an appropriate amount of, of VOC per. So the way that we say it is if it has 50 grams or less per liter, it's considered acceptable. And um, I do want everyone to note, this is addressed on all paint cans and stains, and it should be notable. Um, so you do know what you're buying ahead of time. And then lastly, radon. Uh, radon is actually a naturally occurring radioactive gas, and it kind of seeps through the ground level, um, oftentimes into the foundation of a home. Uh, it is a uh, geographic concern. So here specifically in Santa Clara County, this hasn't been a large issue for us. Different areas throughout the United States experience, experience higher levels of this at a variety of different times um, over you know, the state of California or here specifically in Santa Clara County. 
Um, especially if you have a basement, this typically becomes a concern because it can actually seep through the foundation and then hold itself in a basement where you aren't necessarily getting that well ventilated area. Um, and then it can become a danger. Um, and it's also the second leading cause of lung cancer after smoking. So it is something definitely to be concerned about. There are radon detectors that you can buy at any local hardware store. And then of course, any professional should be able to test that for you as well, if that is a concern of yours. Again, what can you know, rebuilding together Silicon Valley do? We'll review and inspect any prominent areas, provide those lead tests, provide those radon tests if that really is a concern. Um, and then of course, professionally and properly remove any existing contaminants. Okay, maintained. We are almost to the end of our eight safe and healthy housing principles. So what does it mean to keep your home maintained? Um, you know, we kind of use, uh, the idea that just like a car needs an oil change, your home really requires maintenance and upkeep. Um, so if you gotta, if you have to keep your engine safe and happy um, and healthy in order to keep your car properly working by keeping up with it, it's very, very similar to your home. And it's the idea that the more you can maintain it, the less likely you are to have future headaches and other concerns like wasted money. Um, and then of course, health and safety issues. So you can maintain your home in three specific ways. Um, oftentimes it's kind of an investment on the front end versus the back end. So if that is possible, it's just a, it's just a better idea overall. Using higher quality materials will ensure that they'll last longer. Um, if using materials that are easier to care for, a really great example of that is going back to flooring, things like laminate or wood or even tile um, instead of a carpet. Again, those are easier to clean, easier to keep clean easier to ensure that things aren't remaining within them. Um, and then lastly, you know, those materials are likely to last longer. So what can you do to keep your home maintained? Uh, you can look for areas to improve quality materials. So anytime you do have a new repair or you're replacing something, just keep that in mind that that's a possibility and it's more of an investment in the long term rather than the short term. Um, be sure to care for as best as possible existing home materials. Going back to all of these you know, pre previous discussions that we've had, all the different topics, they all really are interconnected. So the more that we can care for our home, um, the better off our, safe, our safety and our health will be. Consider removing problematic landscaping and replace with low maintenance or drought free. Um, this has become pretty popular here in California as you know, we've had drought concerns um, and we call, uh, we use, you know, weather resistant or local um, versions of landscaping and they're better for the environment overall, honestly, um, but it also does, it requires less maintenance um, and then also, of course, requires less water, which is going to be less of an expense on a homeowner as well. You can follow regular home maintenance schedules. There are actually downloadable home maintenance schedules. Um, you can type that into Google and there's a variety of calendars on an annual basis, on a seasonal basis, and a, a variety of recommendations for homeowners to be able to care for their home on a regular basis. And then of course, you can always call a professional. So professionals are, uh, like ourselves are going to inspect areas of concern, Always those kitchens and those bathrooms, those are going to be of the utmost importance. There are highest use spaces and again, kind of the most, um, most likely to run into concerns with, with moisture and um, ventilation and a variety of other things. Um, use, we'll use higher quality materials that are easier to maintain and will last longer. We'll remove and replace um, invasive shrubbery. Unfortunately, a lot of times, I think, um, I always am guilty of this, I think homes that have um, sort of draped shrubs along the outside, they look really beautiful, um, but they're actually really dangerous and you're more likely to have pests or rodents that come in, have landscaping that goes up against the home. So clearing out those spaces is actually usually better for the overall maintenance of your home. And then of course, we, we do encourage our homeowners to replace landscaping with drought tolerant plants. And okay. So last but not, not least, thermally controlled, the impact of a thermally controlled home on your health and safety. So what does that mean? Um, Home temperature control really refers to the process of keeping the interior of a house at a comfortable level, uniformed and regulated by temperature. 
Um, having a uniform temperature means limiting how much temperature changes throughout a room or house. So it's really the idea of homeostasis. Um, it's better for our overall health not to have drastic changes in temperature, but then again, as we talk about air quality, that's really important as well. So how can you keep your home thermally controlled? Uh, you can look for easy air sealing opportunities, our windows, our door frames, anywhere that there may be um, potential for air to come in or out of a home. Um, that air leakage can cause a drastic change in temperature. Um, as many of us know, it can even be something uh, like a financial investment. If you know, They recommend nowadays those dual pane windows versus the um, more antiquated single pane window. And again, that's the idea that you're either letting energy out or you're letting energy in. Um, so how does a thermally controlled home help you? Again, it can be that high energy saving investment. It can improve the overall integrity of your home and it can drastically improve your comfort levels, of course, as well. So what can we do? Uh, always inspect, uh, op we'll look for areas that could be potential air leakage problems and of course seal those. We'll look to add insulation in easily accessible areas that can also be of concern that can keep a temperature um, at a status that is ideal. And we can add or repair weather stripping around windows and doors as well. All right, so that is it for us. And we're now at our question and answer portion. So this is when, um, you know, Robert, if you have any additional questions for me, or if we're gonna have any of our participants add anything in the chat below, it's a really great opportunity to do so. So this is Wilbur, and I'm wondering, if I have pets, how often do I need to sweep or vacuum my pet's dander to keep it from affecting me? Wilbur is very handsome, by the way, <laughs> like his white paws. Um, so we really recommend at least once a week pet dander. As we know, we love our pets and they're like family to many of us. Um, and I think now it's more unprecedented to have our, our pets living in our spaces, sharing our couches and our beds and our other environments. So um, at a minimum, we recommend cleaning the floors and any other um, soft material spaces at least once a week to ensure that if they do have allergens or dust or other things, it's not exacerbating any potential problems for the homeowners or for your family members. Okay, and and so this is this is a good segue question. I, I, you know, it's it's nice weather outside. I like to keep my windows open, but I have seasonal allergies. What should yeah. I do? <laughs> so we always recommend uh, there's an allergen style filter that you can use on a vacuum but then also on in your home vents in the house um, and that's more likely to filter through again anything that's kind of floating in through the air. Um, I'm kind of the same way I like to keep my window open just for some fresh air but oftentimes also the answer is keeping it closed if you're really experiencing serious allergies. Um, or uh, if you, you can go online, I know Amazon has a variety of air filtration systems, a little at home, and uh, they're really ideal for a smaller space, like one particular room, but they can really help filter through uh, the air quality in the room. So I, I, our relationship with Rebuilding Together is through CDBG funding. Um, and, and so I'm curious, you know, how do you determine who to assist? Um, is it first come, first serve? Like what if what if a, a particular jurisdiction doesn't provide you any type of funding? Are you not able to assist individuals in, in those particular jurisdictions? Very good question. So um, my understanding is the way that Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley works is we, we accept applications from everyone throughout Santa Clara County that falls within certain income guidelines. Um, those income guidelines are all included in each of our applications. For one homeowner, um, I believe it's up to about 72,000 as an annual income. Um, and then for a family of four, I believe it's about 110,000. Um, so they're uniform throughout Santa Clara County, but um, we do have certain obligations to each individual city and then the county as well, and then the unincorporated areas. So those obligations are you know, numbers that we meet. We're, our goal is of course to serve as many people as we possibly can. Um, and we are fortunate that we'll go out and we perform repairs on our homeowners and then we are refunded um, through the CDBG process through our individual cities and then the county. Um, but we also have a number of private funders. So that's really when our corporate sponsors come into play. And if we have a potential homeowner that maybe doesn't qualify but has a really compelling need or story or has um, 
more repairs needed than we can necessarily financially invest through CDBG funding, that's when um, that opportunity is really important and we really rely on those private, whether they're individual or corporate um, organizations to come in and provide that extra funding to source a family. Um, specifically, uh, in the city of San Jose, we have a limitation that we can't spend more than $10,000 on an individual's home per application cycle. Um, and as you can imagine, sometimes, especially in, in the Silicon Valley, repairs are really expensive. And if you have something catastrophic, like you need a full roof replacement, Oftentimes that is $10,000, if not more. So we've had a number of homeowners where they have a greater need and they have a really amazing story and you need to get in there and you need to help them and their family. Um, and again, we've been able to pull on a variety of other funding opportunities to provide that gap funding. So that kind of answers my next question, which are, are some projects just simply too large for you? And I guess it sounds like that's a jurisdictional constraint more so than a building really together constraint. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I think sometimes we do have to make some tough decisions, but we're really lucky that we have a great community that supports us. And if ultimately a homeowner really has a high need, we encourage them to apply and we'll do the best we can to source every, every potential um, you know, funder or partner, or um, oftentimes we have really amazing uh, construction companies that will donate in-kind materials or in-kind labor. Um, so again, it's, it, it's, it's up to us as an organization to service our community and to help our neighbors in need in any way that we can. So we definitely don't like to turn people away um, and we, we'll do the best we can to service projects. So we got a question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, how can we find out more about addressing mold issues if we notice black spots? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, if you notice black spots, again, what we would say is more than likely, if, it's, if it seems like it's a superficial concern, um, clean. That's definitely the number one. Uh, put gloves on, potentially a mask, so you're not you know, respirating that potential mold. Um, but clean it. If it doesn't seem like that's going away and you're concerned that it's really a deeper issue, um, we would, again, recommend calling a professional to come and inspect that just, just because it's not worth it to be breathing in that kind of material or if it is a larger scale issue behind a wall specifically due to a moisture issue, um, that's not going to be something you're going to be able to recognize necessarily from the exterior. Can tenants with landlords who are reluctant to do repairs get help with issues you mentioned from rebuilding together? Oh, I'm sorry, Robert, can you repeat that? Sure. Uh, the, the question is, can tenants with landlords who are reluctant to do repairs get help with issues you mentioned from rebuilding together? That's a really wonderful question. I know this is kind of a prominent concern that people have. Unfortunately, right now, due to uh, the nature of our programming and what um, qualifies as an applicant for us, you do have to be a homeowner or a home does have to be owner occupied in order to technically qualify for our services. Um, so unfortunately, landlords also don't count even if they applied if someone else was living in the home. Um, but we do have a variety of partners throughout Santa Clara County that can provide services, um, whether it's advocacy or resources for renters. Um, so we're always, we're always willing and able to source our resource list as well and connect people with whomever may be most helpful. But yes, unfortunately, um, for the time being, we can't necessarily service um, renters or um, landlords that have tenants in spaces. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take this opportunity real quick to just just lay two sort of uh, stories on you. So one of them, um, we we had a, a particular resident in Milpitas who uh, unfortunately was living in a house that was was in pretty bad shape. Um, the the family had no ability to to cover any of the the cost to cure the house. I mean, for as long as they've lived there, they never they never replaced anything uh, to mm -hmm. the extent that there was a about a. 12 to 18 inch hole in their seal in their roof coming all the way down through the kitchen uh water intrusion all the way through i mean all the way down to the subfloor for probably you know 40 years um and thankfully we had a partner like rebuilding together where we can we called and um pretty quickly uh you guys went out and put a tarp over the roof to prevent any further water intrusion um and so it it's it's partnerships like that and stories like that where 
you know, you, you, you feel for these, these folks living in these conditions and, um, you know, through no, no fault of their own, it's, it's just that, the, like you said, the cost of re these repairs are extremely high relative to, you know, a fixed senior citizen income. Um, and so th there isn't a lot of choice involved in, in living like that. You, you, you sort of accept it. And, and so um, thankfully we have a partner like you that we could call and, and, and at least begin the process of uh, ameliorating that situation for them. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing that. I, you know, we hear really often that there, you know, op oftentimes it's very strange to me, but people think there's no such thing as a low income homeowner in Silicon Valley. Um, and I know, you know, it's sort of the myth that every, the cost, well, not the myth, but the cost of living here is astronomical, as many of us know. Um, but there is the myth and an idea that that somehow means that there is no way that anyone could own a home. Um, but really, truly, the people that we support most regularly have lived in their homes for 30 plus years. They're well, you know, I think the average age of our homeowner is about 74. They're typically um, a widowed woman. Um, of course, we service a variety of people, but we have vets um, and you name it. And, and as you had mentioned, the situations that they're in are absolutely at no fault of their own. We have a number of retirees that retired with plenty of savings and thought that, you know, they could live their life well into retirement. And as we know, the cost of living has skyrocketed. The economy has boomed here, but with that comes a variety of additional expenses. Um, and there's other cascade effects like health concerns. Uh, we, we have a number of individuals that are really truly making a decision as to whether they can afford their medication, put food on their table, or repair something in their home. And you'd be surprised um, at how many people are facing those sort of decisions. And of course, the last thing you're going to do is repair a home when, that, when those are sort of the decisions you're faced with. So um, again, thank you so much for telling that story. And we are really proud as an organization to be able to help where we can for our neighbors that need it. Well, I got one more for you. So, the, uh, so at our, at our most, uh, most recent in-person uh, Community Advisory Commission meeting um, where the, the CDBG subgrantees um, you know, all came in and applied for, for funding for their respective organizations, um, we, we allowed them to, to give presentation, but they also were given a one minute public comment. And it was, it was somewhat mm -hmm. striking to me that um, after their presentations, they were given you know, the one minute of public comment. I think all but one uh, gave public comment thanking Rebuilding Together for the work that they do for their nonprofit. So it wasn't that just Rebuilding Together helps the community, but that they also do these critical repairs for other nonprofits who also have the same financial constraints as the individuals you serve, right? right. They're not for profit. They don't have, a, a, you know, discretionary funds to have like the most optimal, um, you know, work environments. And so they, I thought it was very cool that they just all took that time to, to really appreciate, you know, the work that Rebuilding Together does. And I just think, think that just speaks volumes to, you know, your impact in the community. And I just wanted to make sure that that was communicated. Thank you so much. I, I remember being in the office the next day and our awesome development communications manager who had been at that hearing came back and she was completely moved and touched and um, just, I think, overwhelmed by that. And it is it is really beautiful. And we're, again, really, I'm so happy to work for the organization that we do. We've got a really, you know, great team. We always say we're small but mighty and we do the best we can to really support our greater community and you're right it's not just our homeowners it's our nonprofits that have a lot of those same constraints well that's all the questions that i have and i think we're coming up on our eight o'clock deadline here so is there anything else do you want to do you want to pitch the safety at home series uh for uh, on your website sure thank you so much for doing that i'll uh I just change the slide so here's my contact information for anyone who's interested uh, that 408 phone number is our office line, um, and then that's, of course, my uh, specific um, extension. But if you call that office line, you can get a hold of anyone on our team. We are working from home, so if you leave a voicemail, that's how we'll get notified, and then we can call you back. Uh, that's also my email address. Please feel free to reach out with any questions or comments. Um, and if you're interested in applying, if you, you, know, you're, you need services or you have questions, our website is down below. It's www.rtsv.org. Um, you can find applications. You can find any information about our programs available on that website. 
And then also to Robert's point, we have what we uh, just launched as our virtual resource center. And that is, a, that'll be on one of our drop down menus under um, our programming that is available. And we have what we're doing our safety at home series. It covers, um, you know, very similar information to what we talked about tonight, um, but we're piecing it out in smaller segments. So that way it's not overwhelming for people, um, but then they can also uh, comment and question um, and engage as much as they'd like. And we also have them downloadable on that link. So even if you don't sign up for our live sessions, we have them available for you to download and you can see me awkwardly talking to myself on Zoom <laughs> and, um, and providing, you know, again, that information. Um, so our last session for our Safety at Home series, it, it is a four part series. We're doing once a week throughout the month will be next Thursday at 11.30 a.m. And you feel free to email me if you'd like to sign up for that link and participate in that group. It's a really, it's a really wonderful experience. And I just wanna to say too, I'm so thankful to SV at Home and for the city of Milpitas for offering us this opportunity, not only to connect with our community, but provide all of this information and be a resource to everyone. So again, we, you know, we encourage everyone to go out and check out the calendar of events at SV at Home. We have a variety of really wonderful things focusing on the advocacy work, um, specifically around affordable housing and how important this issue is, especially here in the Silicon Valley. And then of course, we're really excited to continue to partner with the city of Milpitas and serve the residents of Milpitas as much as possible. Very well said. I think we should end there. So thank you everybody very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to help. Thank uh, you so much, Robert. Uh, can you do me a favor and just on, oh, here we go. Never mind.